Welcome to Visa's Fiscal First Quarter 2023 Earnings Conference Call. All participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Ms. Jennifer Como, Senior Vice President and Global Head of Investor Relations. Ms. Como, you may begin. Thanks, Jordan. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Visa's Fiscal First Quarter 2023 Earnings Call. Joining us today are Al Kelly, Visa's Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Vasant Prabhu, Visa's Vice Chair and Chief Financial Officer, and Ryan McInerney, who will become the Chief Executive Officer of Visa next week. This call is being webcast on the Investor Relations section of our website at investor.visa.com. A replay will be archived on our site for 30 days. A slide deck containing financial and statistical highlights has been posted on our IR website. Let me also remind you that this presentation includes forward-looking statements. These statements are not guarantees of future performance, and our actual results could differ materially as the result of many factors. Additional information concerning those factors is available in our most recent reports on Form 10-K, which you can find on the SEC's website and the Investor Relations section of our website. For non-GAAP financial information disclosed in this call, the related GAAP measures and reconciliation are available in today's earnings release. And with that, let me turn the call over to Al. Jennifer, thank you, and good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Visa's performance in the first quarter of 2023 reflects stable domestic volumes and transactions and a continued recovery of cross-border travel. Total Q1 payments volume was up 7% year-over-year, or 135% versus three years ago, flat with Q4. Excluding Russia and China, payments volume was up 12%, or 146% of 2019. U.S. Q1 payments volume was up 9% year-over-year, or 144% of 2019, down one point from Q4. International volume, excluding Russia and China, was up 15% or 147% of 2019, up one point from Q4. Q1 cross-border volumes, excluding inter-Europe, grew 31% year-over-year and 132% versus three years ago, up five points from Q4. Excluding Russia, cross-border year-over-year growth was higher by four points. Travel-related cross-border volumes rose six points from 112% of 2019 in Q4 to 118% in Q1, driven by Asia-Pacific, helped by China lifting restrictions, continued modest improvements inbound into the United States, and SAMEA benefiting from the FIFA World Cup. Process transactions were up 10% year-over-year, or 139% versus 2019, and we process 571 million transactions a day during the quarter. Although first quarter net revenues grew, uh, altogether I should say, first quarter net revenues grew 12% year over year, and non-GAAP EPS was $2.18, up 21%. In each of our growth levers, consumer payments, new flows, and value-added services, we saw strong revenue growth. In our consumer payments business, we made significant progress this quarter through large deals with traditional issuers and co-brands. And with the pandemic largely behind us, we saw many businesses focus on payments through Visa's new flows capabilities. In addition, we continued to develop and expand our global value-added services globally. Now let me explore each of these growth areas. <clears throat> In consumer payments, credentials grew 8% overall, 11% excluding Russia with strong double-digit growth in the United States, India, and Brazil. Tap-to-pay penetration of face-to-face transactions globally was 72%, excluding Russia and the United States. In the United States, we surpassed a notable 30%, with San Jose, San Francisco, and New York City all above 50%. U.S. drugstores went above 40% for the first time in the United States, and nearly 65% of Costco's face-to-face credit transactions were made with a tap. In the United States, we had several important renewals. First, 
we renewed our partnership with Bank of America in the United States, maintaining our current debit and credit business, including their cash rewards, travel rewards, premium re rewards, and newly launched premium rewards elite consumer credit cards. We're excited to continue to invest together in the growth of our joint business and to innovate with Bank of America to deliver enhanced capabilities and improved experiences for their customers. Second, we renewed, renewed with Commerce Bank, a top 25 Visa U.S. issuer across their consumer and commercial portfolios. Finally, we also renewed our agreement with Capital One. In Australia, we renewed our agreement with the country's largest independent payment solutions provider, Costco, with over 4 million cardholders for debit and prepaid, and also signed a new agreement for credit issuance. Also in the region, we extended our exclusive relationship with Kiwi Bank, the largest New Zealand-owned bank. In Latin America, we renewed with ICBC Argentina, one of the largest issuers in the country, and with Banco de Brazil, one of the largest visa issuers in the region. In addition, we entered into a new agreement with one of the largest banks in Panama, Banco Nacional de Panama. Also in Latin America, we reached a new strategic deal with fintech platform Tigo Money and parent company Millicom, a leading provider of telecommunications services in the region. Visa and Millicom expect to offer Tigo Money's more than 5 million wallet users the ability to digitize their cash in an easy and secure way, making purchases wherever Visa is accepted with the Visa Tigo Money Access Card. Another strategic FinTech deal is with NEO in India, a fast-growing cross-border focused NEO bank with 5 million customers. We've extended our relationship from debit into credit to grow cross-border spending with affluent as well as corporate customers. We're also happy to share that we renewed and extended our global partnership with HSBC. Our agreement covers consumer and commercial, and it will foster growth and digital acceleration. This deal also cuts across all of Visa's five regions. As you know, Visa is the leader in travel co-brands globally, and I'm happy to report that we recently reached agreements with three important travel relationships. First, Qatar Airways Privilege Club, which today has a split portfolio across networks around the world, has signed a new 10-year exclusive partnership with Visa to enhance and expand its portfolio of co-branded payment initiatives with key financial partners across key markets worldwide. This expanded partnership creates a new world of opportunities for our Visa customers and Privilege Club members to collect and spend avios, the rewards currency of Privilege Club. Second, with Southwest Airlines in the United States, Visa will continue to be the exclusive payment network for their co-brand credit card issued by J.P. Morgan Chase. It represents one of the largest co-brand partnerships in the world. Third, with Star Alliance and HSBC in Australia, this is the world's first credit card created with an airline alliance and is issued exclusively on Visa credit. At the time of the launch, it brought together seven Star Alliance carriers in a, in a single credit card platform. Also, we recently advanced our co-brand partnership with Flipkart, one of India's leading digital commerce entities, with a registered customer base of 450 million. So whether it's with traditional issuers or co-brand partners, we are continuing to position Visa well for the future. On to new flows, where this past quarter, new flows continued to grow with revenue up more than 20% in constant dollars led by strong growth in B2B payments volume and Visa Direct transactions. First, on the Visa Direct side, Visa Direct had 1.9 billion transactions in Q1, up 39% year over year, excluding Russia. We continue to grow globally. Non-U.S. Visa Direct transactions as a percentage of total transactions expanded nearly 20 points, excluding Russia, from Q1-21 to Q1-23. Building on the success of our remittance program with Standard Chartered Bank in Hong Kong, we recently launched Malaysia as an additional origination market, sending across six currency pairs with more currencies to come. We also continued to bring existing use cases to new markets. First in Australia, Visa Direct is now enabling driver payouts with DoorDash. 
Second, we launched our inaugural P2P program in South Africa with FNB, one of the country's largest banks, to enable their 10 million active customers to move money within their mobile app using Visa Direct Rails. Third, we launched our wallet cash payout program in Bangladesh with Bcash. With this launch, the nearly 65 million Bcash users can make wallet to money bank transfers 24 by 7 in near real time using Visa Direct. We are enabling several use cases, including seller payouts in the United States on Poshmark, a social media uh, marketplace where more than 80 million registered users and card top-offs with FinTech GoHenry. As a follow-on to the issuance deal we announced last quarter with them, GoHenry is enabling its members to top up their child's prepaid Visa card with Visa Direct, first in the UK, with plans to expand this service across Europe in the future. In addition to Visa Direct, we had noteworthy developments in the B2B space this past quarter, where commercial payments volume grew 15% in constant dollars. In traditional issuance, we signed an agreement with Rifeson Bank for a new commercial credit partnership in addition to renewing customer consumer credit across their 3 million clients in Austria. And in the United States, we renewed with UBS for consumer credit and debit, as well as several business credit portfolios and Visa Spend Clarity for Business. Another issuing partnership was with Stone, one of the largest acquirers in Brazil, focused on small businesses. Stone has recently become a Visa, direct, a Visa debit and credit issuer of cards that could be embedded digitally in its wallet. On the virtual card front, from, for accounts receivable or payable, we completed several agreements. First, uh, Divi, an expense plat management platform owned by Bill, has renewed its agreement to offer Visa virtual cards for small and mid-sized businesses in the United States as part of its expense and vendor payment solutions. Second, ViewPost converts U U.S. based B2B check payments to Visa virtual cards, and together we are expanding card opportunities for issuers and corporates by offering a solution that can be deployed easily to every commercial business that still produces checks. Third, we've reached an agreement with Plate IQ, a leading end to end accounts payable automation provider in the United States with direct integrations to accounting systems. Plate IQ will be offering a Visa virtual card solution to commercial partners across multiple industries, including restaurants and hospitality, retail and accounting and bookkeeping, among others. Fourth, in our Asia Pacific region, Sunrace, a global payment and treasury management platform, has launched Visa Virtual Cards as part of its solution for more than a thousand B2B clients, including global online travel agencies and small business customers. Fleet issuance continues to grow as well. This quarter we issued, we signed with Zemo, a European fleet and mobility solutions provider, to issue Visa open loop fleet and fuel commercial cards as they expand from three European markets to 10. In the United States, HiNote, a cloud-native card issuance and embedded finance platform, expanded its relationship with Visa with a five-year card issuance agreement across credit, debit, virtual solutions, and fleet. In addition, HiNote became, cert became certified as a fleet, Visa fleet card processor, which provides businesses with more specific product category level controls and more detailed and faster data for real-time decisions on new fleet and fuel card programs. B2B is an active space for fintechs, and Visa continues to partner with new players to drive innovation for businesses. A recent example is Confio, a fintech in Mexico that has already issued approximately 50,000 Visa small business cards and recently expanded its agreement to issue Visa business, business infinite cards. In addition, they are positioned to grow acceptance in the market with their newly established acquiring business, Senior Pago. Now moving to value-added services, which had about $1.7 billion in revenue this first quarter, up more than 20% in cost of dollars. Remember that our focus for value-added services is threefold. 
One, to deepen client penetration of existing products. Two, to build and launch new solutions. And three, to expand geographically. CyberSource is a great example on all three areas of focus. First, on deepening client penetration of existing products. CyberSource's decision manager offering provides broad capabilities to existing CyberSource clients and has experienced strong growth throughout the pandemic, more than doubling transactions in the last three years. In Q1, transactions utilizing Decision Manager grew in the low teens year over year, demonstrating the continued demand for this solution, even as we enter a post-pandemic environment. Another area of growth we have mentioned is with acquirers who utilize CyberSource's capabilities to offer them to their merchant clients. In Q1, we signed agreements with several acquirers for gateway services, including Elevon in North America. In Saudi Arabia, Saudi or British, British Bank has announced a strategic partnership with our CyberSource payment gateway and risk platform to enhance the overall capability, capabilities of SAB's payment gateway with the aim of fostering the bank's growth in an evolving and dynamic e-commerce space. On extended geographically, we've continued our efforts to strengthen our global presence. Our non-U.S. CyberSource transactions have nearly quadrupled since the first quarter of 2019, and they now comprise the majority of our transactions, led in particular by the Asia-Pacific region. CyberSource has also created new offerings. While historically, CyberSource has been an e-commerce capability, over the past few years, we have accelerated the product development of our card present and omni-channel offerings, including with the acquisition of PayWorks back in 2019. In the past quarter, we saw a nearly 50% year-over-year increase in card present authorized cyber source transactions. Other value-added services highlights this quarter include our innovative dispute capability through Verify, which saw nearly 40% growth in cases processed this quarter as we expanded globally, with more than one-third of our cases from outside of North America. This rapid dispute resolution solution automatically resolves disputes between merchants and issuers through the acquirer rails, reducing the average time to resolve a dispute from 24 days to typically seconds. And Tink, our open banking platform, continued to deepen and develop relationships across Europe. Tink recently signed a master agreement with BNP Paribas to be their main open banking and money movement services provider for millions of customers across Europe. Tink is already live with several businesses in the group. Three million customers use Tink's money management, data enrichment, and transactions products at BNP Paribas Fortress in Belgium and BNL in Italy. Tink has also renewed and expanded its commitment with ABN AMRO to integrate Tink's money manager and data enrichment products into the bank's app for more than three million customers. In conclusion, in the first quarter, Visa delivered very strong results and continued to effectively execute our growth strategy. The SOC will go into detail on our thoughts for the rest of the year, but I'd like to make a few other brief closing comments. We will continue to manage our business for the medium to long term and will invest in initiatives that are compelling and will provide future growth, all while being very mindful of the current environment. I continue to see a bright future for Visa as we look ahead to the rest of this year and beyond, and I believe we have the right strategy to continue to deliver great results. As we announced in November, effective February 1st, 2023, I'll be stepping down as CEO and assuming the full-time role as executive chairman. I'm exceedingly grateful to the board and leadership of Visa, in addition to all of our passionate 26,500 employee colleagues who helped make this job so rewarding. I'm proud of all that we have accomplished together since I started in 2016. Brian McInerney will become Visa CEO, and I cannot think of a finer leader to continue to position Visa at the center of money movement in increasingly innovative ways. I worked side by side with Ryan for almost six and a half years. He knows our business, our clients, and he is deeply respected by our employees. He and his team will do a great job, and I expect this transition to be totally seamless. With that in mind, and as Jennifer alluded to, I've asked Ryan to join the Q&A portion of our call today. But before that, let me hand it over to Vasant to provide financial highlights for the quarter and our thoughts for the second quarter and beyond. Thank you, Al. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Our fiscal first quarter results reflect sustained growth in domestic spending and continued recovery in cross-border travel. Net revenues were up 12%, GAAP EPS up 8%, non-GAAP EPS was up 21%. The strong dollar dragged down reported net revenue growth by almost three points and non-GAAP EPS growth by approximately three and a half points. Discontinuation of operations in Russia reduced net revenue growth by about four and a half points. Adjusted for Russia, net revenues were up almost 20% in constant dollars. Net revenue growth exceeded our expectations as value-added services and new flows growth were very strong, currency volatility stayed high, and client incentives were lower than anticipated. A few key highlights. In constant dollars, global payments volume was up 7% year over year and 35% above 2019. Excluding China and adjusted for Russia, global payments volume was up 12% year over year and 46% higher than 2019. U.S. payments volume was up 9% year over year and 44% over 2019. In constant dollars, international payments volume, excluding China and Russia, was up 15% year over year and 47% above 2019. U.S. holiday spending growth was in the high single digits on a year-over-year basis and up more than 41% versus 2019. E-commerce maintained its share of retail spending versus last year, up over five points since 2019. Spending continues to smooth out over the holiday season with Black Friday and Cyber Monday still significant shopping days but less important post-pandemic. Holiday spending around the globe was generally consistent with U.S. trends. The cross-border travel recovery continues. However, as expected, the pace of recovery has moderated as most borders are now open, including Japan in October and now China in January. As a reminder, we saw a very sharp cross-border travel recovery in October and November of 2021, which we are lapping. Index to 2019, Cross-border travel volume, excluding transactions within Europe, rose six points in the first quarter versus a 20-point gain in the third quarter of fiscal year 22 and 10 points in the fourth quarter of fiscal year 22. New plans and new flows in value-added services revenue sustained robust growth in excess of 20% in constant dollars. In the first quarter of fiscal year 23, we bought back approximately $3.1 billion in stock at an average price of a dollar of $198.74. Contributions to the litigation escrow account, which have the same effect as a stock buyback, added another $350 million. We also distributed $945 million in dividends. Now on to the details. In the U.S., credit grew 10% year over year and 35% over 2019, lapping the credit recovery from last year, and as compared sequentially to last quarter, impacted by retail spending and fuel prices. U.S. debit grew 8%, up sequentially over last quarter. Relative to 2019, debit grew 55%, sustaining significantly above the pre-COVID trend line, even as credit has recovered. U.S. card present spend grew 8% year over year, impacted by fuel prices, and retail spend as compared sequentially to last quarter. U.S. card present spend was 26% above 2019. U.S. card not present volume, excluding travel, grew 9% year over year and was 65% higher than 2019. E-commerce spend remains well above the pre-COVID trend line, even as card present spending has recovered. On the international front in constant dollars, Latin America was up 25% year-over-year and 107% higher than 2019. A CEMEA region, excluding Russia, grew 25% year-over-year and was 108% higher than 2019, as we saw all through FY22, growth in both regions was fueled by client wins, cash digitization, and acceptance expansion. Europe was up 10% year-over-year and 34% higher than 2019, impacted by a portfolio conversion that is now nearly complete in the UK. Ex-UK, Europe volumes grew 28% year-over-year and were 71% about 2019, reflecting share gains in multiple markets. 
ex-portfolio conversions, volume trends in the UK remain stable. Asia-Pacific, excluding China, continue to recover, up 16% year-over-year and 34% about 2019. Global process transactions were up 10% year-over-year and 39% over 2019 levels. Constant dollar cross-border volumes, excluding transactions within Europe, but including Russia in prior periods, were up 31% year-over-year and 32% over 2019. Excluding Russia, year-over-year growth was higher by about four points. Cross-border card not present volume growth, excluding travel and excluding intra-Europe, grew 3% year-over-year and was 55% about 2019. Adjusted for cryptocurrency purchases and Russia, cross-border e-commerce spending grew in the low double digits. Cross-border card not present, excluding travel, represented over 40% of total cross-border volume in the first quarter. Cross-border travel spend, in, in excluding intra-Europe, grew 63% year-over-year and is now 18% about 2019. The cross-border cross -border travel, excluding Europe index to 2019, went from 114 in September to 121 in December. Travel in and out of Asia recovered sharply in the quarter by more than 12 points from the mid-70s index to 2019 to 85 for outbound and more than 90 for inbound, helped by Japan. Japan alone improved by about 50 points since opening its borders in October. With China lifting restrictions on January 8th, we expect more recovery to come. Europe inbound and outbound remain strong, with the travel index to 2019 in the 120s for outbound and 130s for inbound, both up slightly from the fourth quarter. Travel outbound from the U.S. to all geographies continue to be strong in the low 140s index to 2019, up six points from the fourth quarter. Travel inbound to the U.S. approached 2019 levels and improved four points in the quarter, likely due, due to the weakening dollar. Travel into Latin America and the Caribbean remained very strong and stable, indexing around 150 to 2019 levels. Travel in and out of Simia indexed in the 130s and mid-120s respectively relative to 2019, with outbound up more than 10 points in the quarter and inbound by more than 15, helped by the FIFA World Cup. Finally, some color on mainland China post the removal of COVID-0 policies. The 40-day 40, the 40 spring festival season is underway in mainland China, the world's largest travel event. Domestic travel is rising sharply. From a revenue standpoint, this will not contribute much. In terms of outbound mainland Chinese travel, this will pick up steam as more flight capacity is available, ticket prices moderate, new passports and visas are obtained, and restrictions are lifted in some corridors. The initial destinations for mainland Chinese visitors look to be Hong Kong and Southeast Asia, in particular Thailand, Singapore, and Malaysia. Inbound travel to mainland China has not increased much and may not until the COVID situation settles down. Moving now to a quick review of first quarter financial results. Service revenues grew 10% versus the 10% growth in fourth quarter constant dollar payments volume. Exchange rate drag was offset by growth from business mix, pricing, and card benefits. Data processing revenues grew 6% versus the 10% process transactions growth. The primary reason is that our data processing revenues are impacted by Russia However, our transactions growth is not. Adjusted for Russia, data processing revenues were up 10%. International transaction revenues were up 29% versus the 31% increase in constant dollar cross-border volumes, excluding intra-Europe. Revenue growth was helped by high currency volatility, although lower than the fourth quarter, and pricing actions, which were offset by exchange rate shifts. Other revenues grew 31%, led by marketing and consulting services, pricing actions, and acquisitions. Client incentives were 26% of gross revenues, below expectations due to some adjustments based on client performance 
and other items. For the year, we expect to renew about 20% of our payments volume with a good, good amount already completed in the first quarter. Revenue growth was robust across our three growth engines. Consumer payments growth was led by the recovery in cross-border volumes, high currency volatility, and continued strong domestic volumes and transactions. New flows revenue growth was over 20% in constant dollars. Commercial card volumes grew 15% year over year and are up 45% versus 2019. Excluding Russia, Visa Direct transactions grew 39%. Value-added services revenue was also up over 20% in constant dollars, driven by higher volume, increased client penetration, and select pricing actions. Currency Cloud and Tink added about half a point to revenue growth. GAAP operating expenses grew 25%. Non-GAAP operating expenses grew 15%. Non-GAAP operating expense growth was higher than expected, primarily due to a smaller exchange rate benefit. The primary drivers of expense growth were personnel costs from hiring activity in the second half of last year and into the first quarter, as well as GNA expenses driven by lower exchange rate benefits, higher travel, and expenses from new acquisitions. Marketing increased 18%, primarily driven by the FIFA World Cup spend and client marketing. We recorded losses from our equity investments of $106 million. Excluding investment losses, non-GAAP, non-operating expense was $7 million, benefiting from higher interest income due to rising rates and some other items. Our tax rate was lower than expected due to the resolution of a tax initiative coming in at 16% GAAP and 16.5% non-GAAP. GAAP EPS was $1.99. Non-GAAP EPS was $2.18, up 21% over last year, inclusive of an approximately 3.5 point drag from the stronger dollar. Through the first three weeks of February, business trends have remained strong and stable. On a year-over-year -year basis, U.S. payments volume was up 14%, with debit up 13% and credit up 14%. Lapping of Omicron-related weakness from last year has contributed to strong January month-to-date growth. The Omicron-related uptick will fade as we get into February. These trends are generally consistent with performance in major markets around the world. Process transactions grew 14% year-over-year. Constant dollar cross-border volume, excluding transactions within Europe, grew 36% year-over-year, and was 42% over 2019 and 32% over 2020. Card not present, non-travel growth was 75% about 2019 and 52% about 2020. Travel-related cross-border volumes were 25% about 2019 and 20% about 2020. We are now past the pandemic recovery stage on domestic volumes and transactions. As such, starting next quarter, we will no longer provide comparisons to 2019 for payments volumes and process transactions. Since the cross-border recovery is still ongoing, we will continue to provide comparisons to 2019 for cross-border volumes through this calendar year. Moving now to our outlook for the second quarter. For the second quarter, we are assuming that trends in domestic payments volumes and process transactions are sustained with some benefit from lapping Omicron in January last year. As a reminder, this continuation of operations in Russia will impact reported payments volume growth rates in the second quarter. Russia will not impact reported process transactions growth. Cross-border e-commerce trends have been stable too, especially when you adjust for Russia and crypto-related volatility. We're assuming cross-border e-commerce growth rates sustained through the second quarter X Russia and crypto. The cross-border travel recovery continued generally in line with our expectations in the first quarter. We are assuming recent trends to sustain into the second quarter. We expect most of the mainland China travel recovery in the second half and beyond for reasons I outlined earlier. We expect outbound travel from mainland China to recover first. The pace of inbound travel recovery will depend on the COVID situation. This continuation of operations in Russia will reduce second quarter net revenue growth by almost five points since we recorded nearly two quarters worth of service fees in the second quarter of fiscal year 22. Based on where the dollar is today and the forward curve, 
exchange rates will reduce reported net revenue growth in the second quarter by about two points. When you put all this together, our planning assumptions get us to mid-teens constant dollar net revenue growth in the second quarter on a run rate basis, i.e. adjusted for Russia. With an almost five-point Russia impact and a two-point exchange rate headwind, reported nominal dollar Q2 net revenue growth would be in the high single digits. Client incentives were below our 26.5 to 27.5% range of gross revenues in the first quarter. Second quarter client incentives are expected to run higher at the upper end of the range, finishing the first half in the middle of the range. As we indicated in October, operating expenses growth rates will moderate through the year as we reduce the rate of increase as well as lap higher levels from last year. In the second quarter, non-GAAP operating expense growth in nominal dollars is expected to be two to three points lower than the first quarter expense growth. Our third quarter non-GAAP operating expense growth rate is expected to decline an additional two to three points with a further two to three point reduction in the fourth quarter. Non-GAAP results exclude certain acquisition-related items and the litigation provision from the third quarter last year. We currently expect non-GAAP, non-operating expense to be in the $40 to $50 million range in the second quarter, driven largely by higher interest income from our cash balances. Our tax rate is expected to be at the upper end of the 19 to 19.5% range for the rest of the year. With a non-GAAP 16.5% rate in the first quarter, the full-year non-GAAP tax rate is now expected to range between 18.5% to 19%. As we said last quarter, should there be a recession or a geopolitical shock that impacts our business, slowing revenue growth below our planning assumptions in the second half, we will, of course, adjust our spending plans by reprioritizing investments scaling back or delaying programs, and pulling back as appropriate in personnel expenses, marketing spend, travel, and other controllable categories. In a business like ours, this always requires a careful balance between short, -term, short and long-term considerations. We have contingency plans in place and will activate them should we need to. Our business has been resilient so far this year. Our first quarter performance has demonstrated Strong, strong consumer payments growth from cash digitization and client wins. New flows and value-added services momentum remains very strong. There is still much uncertainty from an economic standpoint in the months ahead. We will remain vigilant and ready to act. As we look past fiscal year 23, we remain as optimistic as we've ever been about the long-term growth potential of our business. Before I finish, this is a sad day for me personally. It's Al's last week as CEO. Al has been the best CEO I've worked for, and I've worked for many in my career. Al is a wonderful human being, an exceptional leader with extraordinary business judgment. It has been an eventful six years. Despite a three-year global pandemic, revenues have almost doubled, non-GAAP EPS is up over two and a half times, and our stock price has tripled during Al's tenure. I will miss you as CEO Al, along with 26,500 or so others at Visa. With that, I'll turn this back to Jennifer. Thanks, Prasant. And with that, we're ready to take questions, Jordan. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 and clearly record your name. You will be announced prior to asking your question. To ensure all questioners are heard, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question. Once again, to ask a question, press star 1. To withdraw your question, press star 2. Our first question comes from Sanjay Sakrani with KDW. Your line is open. Thanks, and congratulations to Al and Ryan as well. Um, Vasan, as we think about your baseline plan forecasts, how are you factoring in the economy? I mean, are we assuming, you know, resilient consumer, stable economy, or are you assuming some um, mild downturn? Well, we, we went through our, what we call our planning assumptions, uh, you know, last Last, on the last call for the full year, and we told you we had assumed no recession. Um, 
you know, as you can see, business trends have been remarkably stable. Uh, the, you know, spend levels just around the world, they've, they've indexed at in the mid-140s for almost four quarters right now, and there's no evidence of a change in trend. That's reflected in our second quarter outlook. At this point, we're not changing any expectations for the second half. I mean, clearly the dollar has weakened a bit, so that will change, you know, the exchange rate impact in the second half, but we're not changing any of our, our views in the second half. I mean, they are planning assumptions. Um, and if there is a slowdown, then, you know, we will react accordingly. Great. Thank next you. question, Jordan. Our next question comes from Darren Peller with Wolf Research. Your line is open. Hey, guys. So it's nice to see that. It seems like from the trends you're seeing in Q1 and Q and what you're guiding for for Q2, it's an element of conservatism based on the trends so far relative to what we could see in the second half, which I think is what the street probably wanted. But when we we'll just think about the underlying trends for a moment, I mean, some of the strengths we're seeing, like debit being up, still high single digits, constant currency in the U.S. on really tough comps combined with other services. Maybe you could just touch on what's the driving forces of both of those metrics because they were a little better than we thought. And I don't know if it's Visa Direct and the debit side helping or it's, or it's other factors and share. Um, and then if you can comment on other revenue also strength. Thanks again, guys. Yeah, on debit, uh, you know, it's what we told you earlier. Uh, in general, uh, if you look at, you know, the looking at 2019 has kept us uh, honest, so to speak, it, it's a good it's a good view of what's going on. And there's in total spend, it's remarkable stability. What's happening is as good spending slowed down a bit, services spending really took up all the slack, and so consumers have just shifted their spending, but they're spending the same amount, and that's why debit has stayed resilient. Debit has been the biggest beneficiary of the the move to digitization. That happened globally and including in the U.S., more e-commerce, uh, more tap to pay, more people using digital credentials uh, just about in, uh, you know, on any payment occasion. So, uh, you know, some people were worried that when, you know, things settle down that debit might start to see some slowdown. But as you've seen, uh, debit has stayed resilient even as credit has recovered, which has kept our overall payment volumes very stable. Uh, those would be the big trends. And the other question. Other revenue. And other revenue was helped by mostly marketing services and consulting revenue. A fair amount of that linked to the FIFA World Cup. There was a lot of client-related marketing uh, and spending related to the World Cup. Uh, client asked us, clients asked us to activate a variety of programs, and that certainly helped uh, other revenue. Next question, Jordan. Our next question comes from Will Nance with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Uh, hey, guys, thanks for taking the question. I uh, w- wanted to kind of double-click on some of the comments you made around China. It sounds like you guys are, you know, looking towards that region as being a, a fairly big driver of, uh, you know, continued recovery and cross-border travel. I think we heard this morning from uh, from your competitor that, you know, those volumes in aggregate seem to only be something like 1% to 2% of overall cross-border volumes pre-COVID. So I was wondering, you know, given how much of a focus this is for investors as, you know, a driver of continued strong growth, can you put some guardrails around? On, you know how we should be thinking about the magnitude of impact of China once it's fully reopened relative to kind of what we saw in the most recent quarter. Thanks. Uh, well, a couple of things. First, uh, um, you know, our, our numbers are you know fairly close to those of our competitor. Uh, we are, as uh, Vasab said, we really think that first we're going to see the travel being outbound from China to Southeast Asia. I think it's going to be still a bit of time before we're going to see the uh, Chinese traveler back in Europe at the level of pre-pandemic or back in the United States at the level of pre-pandemic. And I think it's going to – people are going to wait and see what's happening uh, with COVID within China. So Basan talked about the fact that we're not counting on any kind of uh, recovery back uh, inbound into China into the second half of the year, but I, I my personal expectation is that uh, we'll, we'll see a, a you know probably a spread of you know three to five quarters before uh, uh, starting in the second half before China gets back to a, a level of uh, of pre pandemic or 2019. So it is uh, you know for us it's you know we we have built our plan around 
pretty much what Vassad said in his remarks and what I just said. And if China comes back uh, faster uh, than we're, we're saying, then obviously that will help uh, us. If it comes back uh, uh, slower, it'll have that the opposite impact. Yeah, I mean, in terms of thinking about the impact, uh, you know, you, you all and we all have been tracking, you know, how is our cross-border recovering relative to pre-COVID levels and are we back on the trend line and so on, as you know. And we've told you now for a few quarters that, you know, many corridors, and I've been through a lot of that, are well above the 2019 level. The three that were not uh, and are still not, uh, U.S. is approaching, U.S. inbound is approaching 2019 levels and was held back by the strong dollar, but Asia is still and I went through the numbers, quite a bit below 2019 levels. Most of Asia is open, only China isn't. So if Asia is going to get back to pre-COVID levels and back to the original trend line, that's where the China impact is going to be visible. And then you expect and we expect, you know, cross -border, that, that cross-border travel index to keep improving through the year. For that to happen, we obviously need China to come back. So it is important. Next question, Jordan. Our next question comes from Lisa Ellis with SVB Moffitt Nathanson. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. I had a question about the evolution of Visa Direct. You highlighted uh, the plus 39% year-on-year growth ex Russia in the quarter. You know, over the, I was, over the last few years, you've been talking a lot with tap to pay and, and contact list about there being sort of this inflection point dynamic where you reach a certain level of critical mass and then growth really accelerates. Is a similar dynamic true for Visa Direct? And can you give us a sense for sort of how we should think about that evolve over the next couple of years? Well, I think, Lisa, uh, you're absolutely right. We're focused in Visa Direct at this point on ex extending into new geographies, uh, new use cases, and more cross-border. I would say those are our focuses. You know, initially out of the chute, Visa Direct go in a country goes – through phase one, which tends to be P2P, before you then get into things like gig economy payouts and uh, and transactions like uh, uh, remittances or uh, uh, insurance payments, those kinds of things. So in the United States, and, and every country is going to go through this kind of evolution where they'll start with P2P, get into things like gig economy payouts, and then get into more sophisticated and remittances and then more sophisticated use cases. And the United States is much further along that continuum. Um, and in other countries, uh, we have made uh, you know, some good progress kind of in that first phase or two, but haven't gotten into more sophisticated use, use cases. And then in other geographies, frankly, we're still uh, uh, not, not there. So I, I think there's a tremendous amount of gas left in the tank in Visa Direct. When I look at uh, the opportunities to uh, take uh, use cases to more sophisticated levels in more markets, to open up more markets, and to put a real focus on cross-border Visa Direct transactions, which will have better uh, yields to them as, as well. So I think your bottom line theory of your question uh, is, uh, you know, I had some, uh, you know, real uh, uh, legitimacy to it, although I would say that uh, it it will be probably a bit longer elevation, uh, a, a bit longer period of time before you reach maturity, simply because of the different amount of use cases, whereas pay to, uh, tap to pay is really kind of a, a single type of initiative. Next question, Jordan? Our next question comes from Dave Coning with Baird. Your line is open. Yeah. Hey, guys. Thanks and good job. Um, I guess my, my question, rest of the world debit is, is the one place where I guess numbers were a little weaker than, than we had thought, negative 2% um, constant currency. Is, is that just a function of portfolio deconversions, Russia, some of the one-off things, and when does that kind of inflect back uh, into positive territory? Well, I think, Dave, when you, uh, you look at it, X China and X Russia, it grew over 10%. And then, yes, you know, the UK migrations in, in particular are happening at a faster pace than we thought. And as Vassad said in his remarks, they're almost fully uh, migrated. So certainly that is having uh, a dragging impact on the growth as well. Next question, Jordan. Our next question comes from Ramsey Ellisau with Barclays. Your line is open. 
Uh, hi, thank you for taking my question tonight. Uh, Al, could you give us your latest thoughts on sort of balance sheet deployment, M&A strategy, what you might be looking for, whether this environment is yielding more potential opportunities or deals, or, or is it time maybe to, to not pursue additional deals as the macro environment remains volatile? You know, nothing has is, nothing is changed in our, our strategy. We're focused first and foremost on organic growth and then and then growing through M&A and then and then from there uh, uh, dividend and share buybacks in that in that uh, order. Clearly, uh, there's been a little bit of a burst of the balloon in terms of some of the valuations in uh, in particular in the in the fintech world. Uh, you know, that is a you know, that's a helpful uh, uh, characteristic of the environment right now. But I think we will continue to look for uh, capabilities and 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 management teams that would uh, uh, bring more value to Visa than we could bring to ourselves organically. And uh, you know we're in we're in constant evaluation of of options. We have a very uh, good corporate development team. It's something that. Uh, Ryan and Vasant in particular spent a, a good deal of, of time on, and when we see something that we think will make us better as a company and has a, a fair value attached to it, we're not afraid to go to go after it. Next question, Jordan. Our next question comes from James Fawcett with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Thank you very much, and and thanks for all the the, the work and effort out over time and. And I wanted to address a kind of a bigger picture question for you and, and maybe for Ryan is that one of the questions we get a lot from investors is how do we think about um, kind of the challenges uh, as we eventually reach some level of, of maturation of card penetration, especially in, in the U.S. and developed markets, um, and especially given some of the preferences we've seen in other countries for them to de develop domestic schemes um, or at least favor domestic schemes. So just wondering if you can provide a little bit of reflection on what we've seen thus far and, and maybe, Ryan, some ideas on, on how we should think about kind of maturation and expansion issues um, going forward. So I'll start, and then certainly Ryan can um, to, to add. First, I, I would say that I believe there, deeply that there is tremendous opportunity in the card, traditional card world both in the consumer space as well as in the B2B space. There are still, there are still hundreds and hundreds of millions of people to bring into the financial uh, mainstream. There are still trillions of dollars spent on cash and checks. And when you look in the B2B space, uh, you know, a, a, we see a total addressable market of about $120 billion across carded, Opportunities cross border and uh, payables and receivables, uh, where I talked a bunch about a number of examples that uh, we have uh, uh, worked on over the course of the last quarter. You know, uh, RTP systems are helping to digitize money movement. That's a good thing. Um, if you look at the disruption caused by monetization in India, it ended up being extraordinarily positive in terms of what it's done in terms of uh, growth uh, in uh, card credentials as well as acceptance, which, by the way, I also should have said in the traditional world is still a tremendous opportunity in, in, to grow our acceptance footprint from the, the, the level that it's at today. You know, these RTP systems are also helping us, and we're leaning into them. They're helping us uh, extend the reach of uh, Visa Direct as we utilize them as part of our network of network strategies. They're helping us with open banking through Pink, uh, where we can facilitate uh, greater access to uh, more uh, developers on one end and, and more financial institutions on the other end. I think RTPs represent an opportunity for us to sell uh, value-added services. And I still think the advantages of uh, the, and the capabilities associated with the, the carded space are still far superior to account to account the, the consumer uh, protections, and, et cetera. And if you look at PICS in Brazil, you look at UPI in India, uh, you know, these things developed and were put in the marketplace, and uh, 
you know, we're seeing a fair amount of, uh, and hearing a lot from clients in terms of fraud associated with these uh, networks. And, you know, in many ways that makes sense. They haven't spent the decades and, and hundreds of millions of dollars that Visa has to build security, uh, fraud capability, risk management uh, capabilities that uh, help keep the, uh, the, the ecosystem uh, uh, secure and trusted by consumers. And I think we have the opportunity over time in the A to A space to bring some of those capabilities and, and, earn, and, and earn some good revenue and yield from them. So, Ryan, what would you add or delete? Not a lot to add to that, Al. It's great. And, I mean, you know, James, just in, in short, we still see a ton of runway. We love our products. We love our people. We love our brand. We love our position. And all these markets, you know, whether they're mature or emerging around the world. So, tons of runway. Next question. Our next question comes from Dan Perlin with RBC Capital Market. Your line is open. Thanks. Um, hey, Al, I just wanted to ask a question about how, you know, when you look at the new business that you've won, let's say, in the past 12, maybe even, you know, 18 months or so, how that kind of sets Visa up as we think about the next, um, you know, I would say the next two years, not really much beyond that. But and the question really here is, is it, you know, is it tilting to take advantage more of, of debit trends, credit trends, global hospitality? And I'm kind of asking because MasterCard kind of called it out this morning as their positioning in travel, and it sounds like you were also kind of hinting at some positioning uh, for your business. So I would just be interested to know what that new business pipeline that you brought in suggests over the course of the next two years for your company. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you a, co a, a, a couple of things, Dan. Number one, uh, on the travel front, it's been a focus for us for a long time, and I, I uh, I think we have about 650 co-brands around the world. Many of them are, are travel co-brands, and I, I think we're the, the leading co-brand player on the planet. Um, I think that uh, when I look around the world, there's certainly opportunities with traditional uh, issuers. We've made a lot of inroads in markets like Brazil and Chile, the Netherlands, uh, Germany, uh, uh, Japan, uh, over the – the, the past year, we've had some great renewals in the United States uh, over the last couple of years, from J.P. Morgan Chase to Wells to the ones I talked about today in terms of uh, uh, Bank of America, Cap One, Commerce uh, uh, Bank. But we've also made great inroads with fintechs and neobanks. Uh, we uh, have had a great uh, track record of wins in the last uh, uh, 24 to, to 36 months. And, uh, you know, a lot of these people are getting to be sca to scale in their particular markets. And I think for, for us, we have to have, um, you know, a, a, a wider lens in terms of who, who can provide services. We're trying to get our, make sure we have, get Visa cards in as many wallets as, uh, as we, we can around the world. And then I'm going to come back to acceptance. Uh, you know, one of the great ways to continue to grow our business is to grow our acceptance footprint. Uh, which, you know, still requires a lot of growth around the world. You know, one of the places we've concentrated on that in the last uh, year and a half is is Latin America. And if you look at the ratio of uh, spending in Latin America that went from uh, – moved from uh, cash to uh, PV uh, in the last couple of years, you know, back in, in full year 2020, only 46% of Latin America's volume – uh, was PV with 54% being cash. This past quarter we just finished, 59% uh, of their PP, uh, PV, 69% uh, of their volume was purchased by them. So there was a 13-point swing in, in La the Latin America region in the last not even quite th uh, three years. And that's a combination of winning with traditional FIs, winning with fintechs, having a localized market-by-market -market approach with a lot of good, really good progress in countries in, South, in Latin America uh, like Brazil and, and Chile. Next question, Jordan. Our next question comes from Arshith Awarwet with Bernstein. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, Al, best wishes to you and we'll miss hearing from you on this call. Uh, Ryan, congratulations. Can you talk about how – this is good strategy and organization will evolve under your leadership. Are you planning to focus more or less on certain things or do some things differently? And, and Russell, very quickly, um, can you comment on the like, detail in, from your fiscal quarter to 1Q, 
You talked to us on the dynamics, uh, but how is that relative to your initial expectations? Thank you. Harshid, I don't think we got the second half of your yeah. question, because maybe we can knock that off, and then Ryan can talk. Oh, you did? Okay. I think you were asking about, you said decel, I'm assuming you meant deceleration yes. between the first and the yes. second. Yeah, I mean, it's just a couple of things. Um, you know, the Russia impact is a little larger in the second quarter because we had almost two quarters worth of service fees last year. Uh, remember, we recognized service fees with a lag. So the service fees recognized in the first quarter were based on Q4 growth rates. So sequentially, Q1 was a little lower, so Q2 service fees will be impacted by that. Um, also, uh, currency volatility is moderating as we speak. Uh, it has been moderating for a few weeks. And incentive growth is a little higher, as you saw. So you put it all together. You know, we were a little better than we expected. As you know, we thought we would be, you know, high single digits in the first quarter. We were higher for the reasons I mentioned. We'll be high single digits in the second quarter. That's our expectation right now. Hi. Yeah, and on the first part of your question, um, you know, I, I've been our president now for close to 10 years. So I've been shoulder to shoulder with Al and Vasant and the rest of our team as we've made all of our key decisions, as we've developed our strategy, as we've executed our strategy. So, you know, it probably won't or shouldn't surprise you. I, you know, I'm going to continue to focus on the three growth pillars that we've laid out, consumer payments, new payment flows, and value-added services. And you know, my priorities are going to be focused on doing everything that we can to accelerate our progress and accelerate our momentum. So how do we go to market? How do we work with clients? How do we ship product faster? How do we sell solutions more effectively to our clients? And to part of your question, how do we organize? Uh, so uh, earlier this month, I announced a, a new organizational structure that really reflects our strategy that we talk with all of you about all the time. And we believe it's going to help us accelerate our progress in all three of those growth vectors. Uh, to give you a, a quick sketch of that, uh, Oliver Jenkin, a uh, longtime uh, Visa veteran who many of you know, is going to lead a new global markets organization that includes driving our consumer payments growth in, in all of our markets around the world. So our five regional presidents will report to Oliver. Uh, Chris Newkirk, uh, who formerly led our strategy organization, uh, is going to lead our New Flows business unit, reporting directly to me. Uh, Anthony Cahill, who is our former deputy CEO of Europe, is going to lead our value-added services business unit, reporting directly to me. So our global markets team, our uh, value-added services business unit, our New Flows business unit, all will report directly to me. And then uh, just to round that out a little bit, uh, Jack Forstell, who also many of you know, will become our chief product and strategy officer, and we'll partner closely with our president of technology, Rajat Tanasia. And the two of them are focused on delivering a, a robust product and innovation roadmap, shipping world-class products and services that help our clients grow their businesses and deepen their relationships with their customers. So that gives you a sense of where we are with strategy and, and the organization. Next question, Jordan. Great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ken Sahasky with Autonomous Research. Your line is open. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks for taking the question, and congrats to uh, to Alan Ryan. Um, I think you mentioned earlier that you're keeping the second half guidance unchanged. Um, can you just remind us what that guidance was with, from either a, a volume or net revenue standpoint? Just because, you know, I think we have uh, only the prior uh, kind of full year guidance, and I know there's. Uh, uh, FX that that's uh, becoming uh, less of a headwind as you get into the uh, the second half. Thank you. Yeah, when we when we talked to you last quarter, we said for the full year revenue growth would be, you know, somewhere in the mid teens on a constant dollar basis, adjusted for Russia. And then when you adjust for Russia, and you adjust for a, a, a full year impact at that time of about two points on FX, it was going to be high single digits in nominal dollars. Um, <clears throat> And so you know sort of where we are in Q1 and Q2, um, and exchange rates have moved around some. So, uh, you know, you can do some of the math. We're basically not changing any views on the second half right now uh, because, you know, trends have been still fairly stable. The only thing you might want to change is what the exchange rate impact in the second half might be based on where rates are right now. Uh, I also gave you fairly clear Operating expense expectations, you know, we were at about 15% growth in the first quarter. We said 
Growth will be two to three points lower in nominal dollar terms in the second quarter, another two to three points lower in the third quarter, and another two to three points lower in the fourth quarter. And that reflects what we had said last quarter, that is expense growth will moderate through the year, both as we moderate the rate of increase, but also as we lap higher levels of expenses from last year. So those pretty much are the sort of the broad outlines of what we said last quarter. And then, you know, we'll update you once again on our next call with any changes we might have based on trends. Last question, Jordan. Our final question comes from Tin Jing Wong with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hey, thanks so much, and congrats to Al and Ryan. Excited for both of you. Um, on the on the renewal front and new deal front, I'll ask on that if you don't mind. Any call outs on on pricing, contract requirements, that kind of thing? I know you named a bunch of big names on the renewal front. Mastercard talked about the citizens when they're just just curious what's happening in the whole balance of trade area. Thanks. Well, it's a competitive, it's a competitive world out there, Tintin, as you well know. Uh, you know, I think that uh, you know, with, there's there's a, a a price that you need to get to, and then a lot of it has to do with the combination of uh, in, incumbency or not, uh, your the capabilities you have, uh, what your lineup of, um, of uh, uh, customers, clients are in that in that market. What kind of experience you uh, you've had? What kind of innovative ideas you bring to the table? The other kinds of capabilities that we have in terms of uh, services and, and new flows. So, yeah, you know, every deal is 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 different and potentially hinges on on different things depending upon the the needs of of, of a particular client, uh, and we. We try uh, to be very bespoke uh, when we look at deals and, and, and talk to clients because their because their needs and their situation uh, will always tend to be a, a bit different. And with that, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. If you have additional questions, please feel free to reach out to the investor relations team. Thanks again, and have a great day. Thank you for your participation in today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.